I'd like to start by introducing you to our presenter today. Dr. Jennifer Janelle is a faculty member for the Florida Caribbean Age Education and Training Center. She is the principal investigator for the University of Florida Gainesville Local Performance Site. She has given lectures on the clinical management of HIV in adults and participates in medical chart reviews throughout the region. Dr. Janelle is clinical assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Medicine with the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville. Dr. Janelle is a board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases and has been providing HIV care for more than 10 years. She provides direct patient care for HIV-infected patients in Columbia, Sumter, and Putnam County. Dr. Shell, I would love, uh, Dr. Janelle, I'd like to turn it over to you for today's session. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm really happy to be here. I am going to go over our session objectives. I'm hoping that by the end of this session, uh, everybody will be able to apply the CDC revised recommendations for HIV testing for adults, adolescents, and pregnant women in healthcare settings that was released in 2006. I want uh, everybody to be familiar with the rationale for and benefits of the fourth generation HIV uh, 1 and 2 antigen and antibodies test. And I want to describe changes uh, in the recommended HIV testing algorithm that was released by the CDC last year. Routine HIV screening is really important. It's estimated that 1.2 million people in the United States are living with HIV infection, and the annual incidence uh, is approximately 50,000 cases per year. So we know that there are lots of people that are undiagnosed and people that are newly infected that haven't yet been diagnosed that uh, we might be missing if we're not doing routine screening. Approximately 20 to 25 percent of people living with HIV infection are unaware of their infection. And in the past, risk-based testing strategies have failed to identify all of those who need screening, and that results in late diagnosis of HIV when people may already have uh, complications of HIV infection, including opportunistic infections and cancers. Now this is a little bit old, but this is the uh, HIV treatment cascade um, from some articles from 2011. And on the left is the estimated number of people that are HIV infected. And then if you go all the way to the right, um, those are folks that are on treatment and have uh, undetectable uh, HIV virus. And there's a lot of people in the middle, and you can see this downward slope. Um, of people that kind of fall out of care and need to, um, we need to try and uh, reach those folks. So the first step is, of course, to reach that 21% of people that are undiagnosed. These people cannot engage in treatment that is known to reduce morbidity and mortality, and they may participate more often in high-risk uh, HIV transmission behavior and have a higher risk of transmitting HIV to others than do those who are aware of their HIV infection. And many may already have advanced disease but may not have entered uh, into healthcare where that can be diagnosed in time to really impact on their morbidity and mortality. 49% of people have been diagnosed uh, but have not retained in care. So we really have a lot of work to do. And this is work uh, that we uh, HIV providers uh, are concerned about, but that also folks that are in the community uh, and folks that don't specialize in HIV uh, should be concerned about as well because this really could impact uh, a lot of our patients uh, and everybody's role in affecting this uh, treatment cascade uh, is really, really very important. We all have a part in bringing everybody over to the right side. The desired outcome of routine testing is, of course, having people be diagnosed and linked to care. Linkage to care does uh, improve survival and quality of life, uh, and folks uh, in care uh, are known to uh, be more careful with their risk behaviors, and if they're on therapy and have a low viral load, uh, that might prevent new HIV infection. And this is a, a diagram of uh, the awareness of serostatus among people with HIV and the estimated rates of transmission. And if you look on the left, the 75% of people who are aware of their infection uh, only account for about 46% of new infections. 
whereas the 25% of people that are unaware of their infection account for about 54% of new infection. And the thought is that if the people are aware of their infection, they will take steps to either practice safer sex or needle use uh, practices um, or other um, prevention methods to prevent new infection. Who is most at risk for HIV? According to uh, the CDC in 2012, uh, among adults and adolescents diagnosed with HIV infection in the United States in six dependent areas, an estimated 64% of all diagnosed uh, infections were attributed to those who practiced male-to-male -male sexual contact. An estimated 17% of all diagnosed infections were attributed to heterosexual contact for females, 9% for males, and an estimated 4% of all diagnosed infections were attributed to injection drug use for males and 3% for females. There was a recent study published in JAMA looking at uh, trends in the diagnosis of HIV infection in the United States from 2002 to 2011. Nationally, there's been about a 30% decrease in the HIV diagnosis rate over that time. Overall, diagnoses attributed to male-to-male -male sexual contact stayed stable. However, when you look at uh, a little bit closer at diagnoses attributed to men that have sex with men contact uh, from 2002 to 2011, you'll see that the older men uh, are less represented in this sample, and there's a huge number of people in the much younger age range of 13 to 24, uh, 24 years represented. Uh, and those are people that are often very difficult for us to be able to reach with um, risk-based testing. They may not uh, be uh, as likely to be in uh, healthcare settings. So we really need to make sure that we also focus our testing on these younger uh, folks that are at very high risk. And just a reminder about the benefits of knowing H your HIV status. If you're HIV negative, you can continue to practice safer sex and needle practices. You can really um, get better about talking to your partners about condom use, cleaning your needles, or using um, uh, syringes that uh, contain less blood uh, at the end of injections um, for people that aren't in states that have a needle exchange program. Uh, and these folks can also be assessed to see if they're candidates for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Those that are found uh, to be HIV positive can really become quite good at uh, understanding what safer sex and needle practices are. Uh, they'll understand their risks better. Uh, they can use antiretroviral therapy both for their individual patient health and also to prevent infection uh, to sexual and injection partners. I'm going to switch gears now and start talking about the revised recommendations uh, for HIV testing uh, for adults, adolescents, and pregnant women in healthcare settings. This was published way back in 2006, and still a lot of states like Florida um, have not uh, been able to uh, adhere to all the recommendations that the CDC put forth uh, in this uh, guideline recommendation. But the objectives uh, for this are really uh, very exciting objectives. We want to think about increasing HIV screening of patients in all healthcare settings, including pregnant women. The goal is to foster earlier detection of HIV infection. We really don't want people showing up uh, later in infection with complications. We want to identify and counsel people with unrecognized HIV infection and link them to care and prevention services. And we definitely want to reduce perinatal transmission of HIV. So how does HIV screening fit in with the public health screening rationale? The public health screening rationale is to identify unrecognized health conditions so that treatment can be offered before symptoms develop. For communicable diseases, we want to screen to prevent continued transmission in communities. The HIV screening rationale fits into this very well. HIV is a serious health disorder that can be diagnosed prior to symptom development. It's a reliable, inexpensive, and non-invasive screening test. Life years can be gained with early treatment, and it has a reasonable cost-benefit relationship. And we know that for many, knowledge of infection decreases transmission. There are several steps um, in the 
uh, guideline recommendations. Uh, these include screening for HIV infection, repeat screening, consent and pretest information, diagnostic testing for HIV, and, and then recommendations for testing in pregnant women. And we'll cover all five of these individually. We'll start with screening for HIV infection. In all healthcare settings, routine screening for HIV is indicated for patients aged 13 to 64, unless the prevalence of undiagnosed HIV infection is less than 0.1%. According to the CDC, in populations with undocumented HIV prevalence, voluntary routine screening should be initiated, and if after screening 4,000 patients, no HIV-infected people are identified, then you've reached the upper limit of the 95% uh, confidence interval uh, for prevalence uh, at less than 0.1%, and routine screening can be stopped and replaced with risk-based screening. And the CDC does recommend opt-out screening. Opt-out screening is where the HIV test is performed after notifying the patient that the test will be performed and then the patient has the opportunity to elect to decline or defer testing. Consent is inferred unless the patient declines testing. For those of us that practice here in Florida, this is not um, the way the current um, statutes for HIV testing are written. Um, Florida is an opt-in state, and we'll discuss that just a little bit more later. Opt-out HIV screen has some benefits. It removes separate uh, consent requirements. It removes prevention counseling requirements. It makes routine screening systematized. People can do it easily. And it really destigmatizes uh, HIV testing. I don't know about you guys, but as soon as I pull out the uh, paperwork for them to sign an informed consent for HIV testing, people see it as a totally different test than any other test that we might recommend in the clinical setting. Opt-out screening is used in uh, prenatal care settings, even here in the state of Florida, and it has been very successful uh, overall. Routine screening for HIV infection is also indicated for those initiating treatment for tuberculosis. HIV is the greatest risk factor for progression from latent tuberculosis infection to TB disease, uh, and so screening for HIV in this population is very important. Screening is also recommended for those seeking treatment for sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, that includes all patients attending STD clinics and at each visit for a new complaint. And those of you um, who are familiar with STDs will recognize uh, this rash on the palms of this man's hands uh, as that of secondary syphilis. So we've gone over screening for HIV infection, uh, and that should be done uh, as we just discussed. However, some people uh, need to be screened more often and might be candidates for repeat screening. These folks are people who are at high risk for HIV infection. These include injection drug users and their sex partners, people who exchange sex for drugs or money, sex partners of HIV infected people, men that have sex with men or heterosexual people who themselves or their partners have had more than one sex partner since their most recent HIV test. Patients and prospective partners starting a new sexual relationship should be encouraged to have uh, screening for HIV infection, and I usually encourage my patients uh, to also uh, get screening for STDs uh, just to make sure there won't be any complications. Those who are a source of occupational blood and body fluid exposure should be uh, screened, even if they've recently been screened in the last year. Uh, and uh, screening can also be done based on provider clinical judgment. So we've covered screening uh, pretty well, and we'll move on now to consent and pretest information. Screening should definitely be voluntary. Uh, the CDC does recommend opt-out testing. We discussed that just a few minutes ago. Um, signed informed consent should no longer be required. However, in some institutions, um, I know that it still is, and that's a legislative issue that we're trying to work through. We should document declinations in the medical record, and uh, prevention counseling is not required. Diagnostic testing for HIV infection was also covered by these recommendations. Diagnostic testing is done when you actually suspect someone might have HIV infection. 
Uh, some of the symptoms that might suggest acute addiction are shown on this slide and include fever, weight loss, malaise, headache, uh, lymphadenopathy, rash, GI symptoms including nausea and vomiting, liver and spleen enlargement, uh, and myalgias. You also should do diagnostic testing for those who have had a recent high-risk exposure. And this uh, graph is just to remind us that uh, different HIV tests become positive at different times. The HIV viral load uh, starts to rise at about 11 days after exposure. The HIV P24 antigen starts at about 17 days. And then HIV uh, antibody usually appears somewhere around 22 days. Uh, if you're testing someone that you think has recent high-risk exposure, testing for all three, the viral load, the P24 antigen, and the HIV antibody will give you uh, your best yield. Testing is very important in pregnant women. We definitely want to uh, make sure that pregnant women receive appropriate treatment and management throughout their pregnancy to prevent transmission to their child. Screening in pregnant women is done through a universal opt-out screening. If a woman declines screening, we need to address the reasons for her to decline that test and document those in the chart. There are various times that it's recommended to do the HIV antibody test. That includes early during pregnancy, and then you want to repeat in the third trimester, ideally at less than 36 weeks gestation, uh, so that you can make plans with the uh, OBs about interventions during delivery. For those that do not have evidence of HIV testing during pregnancy, rapid testing should be done during labor. And then you can do postpartum and newborn testing as indicated. The incidence or the prevalence of HIV is very important when you're thinking about um, testing during pregnancy. High prevalence states um, definitely have legislation that indicates testing twice during pregnancy, and that includes the state of Florida. And you can see um, on this uh, map the different uh, states with very high rates of HIV prevalence. We need to be very conscious of uh, the need to screen pregnant women uh, in these states uh, to prevent transmission to their babies if they become positive during pregnancy or are already positive. Various organizations um, have uh, made comments about uh, the screening recommendations uh, recommended by the CDC, and have, some have made their own recommendations, and that includes um, the American College of Physicians. They do recommend that clinicians should adopt routine screening for HIV and encourage patients to be tested, uh, and clinicians should determine the need for repeat screening on an individual basis. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that patients should be uh, screened at least once by age 16 to 18 years if the HIV prevalence is greater than or equal to 0.1%. If the HIV prevalence is less than 0.1%, routine uh, testing for sexually active adolescents and those with other risk factors uh, for HIV can be considered. For the American uh, Academy of Family Physicians, they recommend screening adolescents aged 18 to 65 and screening younger adolescents and older adults with increased risk. And then the United States Preventative Services Task Force uh, weighed in uh, in 2013, recommending to screen for HIV all of those aged 15 to 65, younger adolescents and older adults with an increased risk for infection in and also screening pregnant women, and that's a grade A recommendation. And they um, also recommend opt-out testing. I wanted to um, focus a little bit on uh, reimbursement for HIV testing. I know in a lot of situations um, there isn't uh, an abil availability for reimbursement, uh, but in some situations uh, we may be able to get reimbursed for uh, HIV testing. It is a state decision to cover routine HIV testing. This is a, uh, a map from the Kaiser Family Foundation showing uh, which states have authorized Medicaid coverage of routine HIV screening. Those of us uh, down here in Florida, Florida did not uh, accept uh, Medicaid coverage of routine HIV screening. It does allow reimbursement for diagnostic testing, uh, but not for routine testing. 
Those who have coverage under the Affordable Care Act, including marketplace private insurance plans, they will cover preventive services, including HIV screening for everyone aged 15 to 65 and other ages considered other ages for people at increased risk. There's no co-payment to the enrollee when uh, services are delivered by a network provider. Medicare pays for voluntary HIV screening, a maximum of once annually for beneficiaries at increased risk of, for HIV infection. Um, for those that are pregnant, it pays for voluntary HIV screening a maximum of three times per term of pregnancy, beginning with the date of the first test when ordered by the woman's clinician. And you can do it when the diagnosis of pregnancy is known, during the third trimester, and at labor if ordered by the woman's physician. As I mentioned before, Florida does have opt-in HIV screening, uh, except for pregnant women. That is opt-out in our state. This requires that the patient, when offered an HIV test, to actively give permission to be tested before testing can occur. There is a bill before the legislature to change testing options from opt-in to opt-out. In that situation, healthcare providers shall notify individuals that the test will be performed and that they have the right to decline. And um, definitely, if you're in the state of Florida and you feel passionately about this, you can contact um, your senator and representative to uh, provide your uh, support. I wanted to um, go into advances in HIV testing. Most of us um, are using the combination HIV antigen antibody test um, when we're testing through uh, the Department of Health uh, lab uh, and in many uh, private uh, facilities. Some are not, and so I want to make sure everybody's uh, comfortable with this test. And I wanted to also go over the new CDC diagnostic testing algorithm. So we went over this just a little bit before. This is a typical course of an HIV-infected individual who's untreated. And on the left, uh, you can see time zero, which is when the person's exposed to HIV. And the red line is the plasma viral load. And you can see that it starts to peak right uh, at about six weeks. Uh, then the CD4 count is the green line, and it really can sometimes take a big dip right then in primary infection and often comes back up and uh, remains stable for a period of time before it drops off again. Uh, so in primary infection, folks are generally very highly infectious because their viral load will be very, very high because they have no antibody to bring it down. One of the other things that appears during primary infection is the HIV-1 P24 antigen, and that's actually a structural component of the HIV virus. And you can see at the bottom the P24, which is uh, a part of the capsid of the virus. Well, this is present um, throughout infection. However, um, at, uh, after primary infection, an antibody forms to the P24 antigen, and you can't detect it any longer. So that is a marker of early infection. So right now, um, we are talking about the fourth generation EIA test, which is the second line from the bottom. And if you go up from uh, the left hash mark there, you can see uh, that that test should be able to pick up infection at about 17 days because it can pick up that HIV P24 antigen. Remember, if you have someone with acute HIV infection, uh, you should also add, or that you're concerned about that, you should also add uh, a viral load to improve uh, the possibility of making a diagnosis early in infection. The fourth generation HIV P24 antigen antibody combination assay was approved by the FDA in June of 2010, and it detects the HIV-1 P24 antigen and antibodies against HIV-1 and HIV-2. It doesn't distinguish between the HIV-1 or HIV-2 antibodies, and we have to do an HIV-1 and 2 differentiation assay to be able to tell whether the person's infected with HIV-1 or HIV-2, and that can have an impact on what medications uh, are appropriate for um, treatment for that patient's particular virus. But remember, HIV-2 is still very uncommon in the United States. This test does detect acute as well as latent infection. It detects acute infection by uh, picking up that P24 antigen. And remember that 10 to 50% of new HIV infections are acquired from people with acute HIV infection because that's 
when that viral load is super high and there's a huge risk of transmission with that high viral load. This chart shows the um, FDA-approved fourth-generation HIV antigen antibody combination assays. Uh, the one that uh, we use uh, in diagnostic uh, testing in most uh, facilities is the Abbott Architect HIV antigen antibody combination assay. It's fully automated. Um, it's very sensitive during early infection. It has a really fast turnaround for the initial result. It's less than 30 minutes. And it requires minimal tech time to process the specimen. So this is a great test in that um, you can get those results quickly. It's very sensitive. Um, it doesn't differentiate P24 antigen from the HIV 1 and 2 antibody results. So just doing that um, test, um, you're not going to be able to know if the person's positive uh, because they picked up a P24 antigen uh, and has acute infection or whether they're positive because they already have um, antibody that's developed. The BioRad GSHIV combo antigen antibody uh, EIA is semi-automated and it's really used um, mostly for uh, transplant testing. It's not something that's routinely used for testing uh, in most facilities. And then there's a new point-of-care CLIA wave test, the allele-determined allele HIV-1 and 2 antigen antibody combo assay. This is highly sensitive during early infection. It distinguishes the P24 antigen from HIV-1 and 2 antibody uh, results. It has a rapid uh, turnaround. It takes about 20 minutes. Now, this is a screening test. Um, it, positive results require confirmation by a laboratory test but you can do this at a point of care. And I think it's so simple, even I can do it. So if I can do it, I think you can do it. Um, it's very easy. You tear off a strip. Uh, you add a sample of whole blood. So this isn't something you're going to do um, from uh, saliva. You wait a minute. You add that chase buffer. And then you get bands that will tell you what part of that test is positive. Is it just the control? Is it the control plus an antigen? Is it the control plus antibody, or is it all three? Um, so you can uh, read that very easily. It's very sensitive and specific, but remember it does require uh, whole blood. The CDC uh, testing algorithm that uh, was released last year is a very exciting development, I think. When you look back, we've been using the same algorithm since 1989. That, um, there have been so many developments in uh, the EIA tests that that algorithm became very um, out of date uh, over the last several years. Remember the algorithm started with an initial EIA, uh, and then if that was negative, the patient was considered negative. If it was positive, then you went to a supplemental test, either the Western blot or an immunofluorescence assay. You could get tests that are easy to interpret. You could be HIV negative. You could be HIV positive, or you could get the dreaded indeterminate result. Uh, that indeterminate result uh, can represent either an incomplete antibody response to HIV in specimens from infected persons or nonspecific reactions in specimens from uninfected persons. Most people with an initial indeterminate Western blot who are infected with HIV will develop a detectable HIV antibody within a month. Um, but it can lead to people having a false sense of security that they are uninfected. So there were some problems with that prior testing protocol that we just went over. The new HIV assays are able to detect HIV sooner after infection than the older assays. And false positives or indeterminate Western blots or IFAs can occur in early infection. There was a difficulty with accurate diagnosis during acute HIV infection. And HIV-2 infections were often misclassified as HIV-1 by the HIV-1 Western blot. And just to show you why that Western blot is a confirmatory test uh, became a problem over time, you can see way over on the right is when the Western blot becomes positive. And as you go to the left, these are the newer uh, EIA tests, and those can become positive way before the Western blot is positive. That can lead to a big uh, complication uh, with patients being diagnosed positive with a screening test but are confirmatory being negative and the person is actually positive. So the whole goal of improvements in these tests is to decrease that window of antibody. And so 
over time, the improvements in those uh, early screening tests have gotten better and better, and we needed to change the algorithm to have confirmatory tests that can handle those early tests and not lead to false negative results. So last year, uh, the CDC released uh, their HIV testing algorithm they had been working on for many years, and it starts off with that fourth generation HIV-1-2 immunoassay that we talked about sooner. That one includes uh, the P24 antigen test, and it also includes uh, an antibody assay against HIV-1 and 2. If that test is negative, then people are considered negative for HIV-1 and HIV-2 antibodies and P24 antigen. If any aspect of that test is positive, then patients go on, their sample goes on to an HIV-1, HIV-2 antibody differentiation immunoassay, and that can give you uh, a range of possible results. If the result is an HIV-1 that is negative or an indeterminate, or an HIV-2 that is negative, but that screening test, that initial fourth generation immunoassay was positive, then you go on to an RNA. Um, if that RNA is positive, then it's very likely that person has acute HIV-1 infection. If that RNA is negative, then they're considered negative for HIV-1. Now remember, nothing is perfect, and patients can be still positive in an early infection, and this algorithm may not uh, diagnose them. So it's very reasonable to repeat this test if you suspect uh, that somebody has acute HIV and they just didn't test positive initially. So it's very, always use your clinical judgment. I wanted to talk a little bit more about this HIV-1, HIV-2 antibody differentiation uh, immunoassay. This is kind of neat. It's a multi-spot HIV-1, HIV-2 rapid test, and it is a point of care test and it's very quick to turn around in about 20 minutes um, and basically you load your sample on the top of this block and then you look at which spots become positive to make the determination of whether the person has HIV-1, HIV-2 or potentially uh, has both. There are a lot of benefits of the new HIV testing algorithm. It does allow increased detection of acute HIV infection with the antigen antibody combination assay. You use a um, NAT confirmation of acute HIV infection. This eliminates inconclusive, indeterminate results by eliminating that Western blot that uh, may be negative even when the screening tests say that it's likely this person has HIV infection. It really decreases the turnaround time, and it can uh, promote quick linkage to care because people aren't waiting you know, a week or a week and a half to get that Western Blot confirmation back. They'll have their results pretty quickly. It does allow improved detection of HIV-2 infection, uh, which also can be very important. So in summary, the 2006 uh, CDC revised recommendations for HIV testing for adults, adolescents, and pregnant women in healthcare settings are supported by many medical groups. And it's been um, great that uh, it was supported uh, it, that it was supported by the um, Preventive Services Task Force uh, as a Grade A recommendation um, because that allows us to work on reimbursement from insurances. These many medical groups had different opinions about uh, the age groups that should be tested. The CDC does recommend testing uh, ages 13 to 64. The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommended uh, ages 15 to 65. Remember that these um, age ranges are just really for uh, people that you think are not at super high risk. If you think somebody's at high risk, they should, of course, be tested um, regardless of their age. All pregnant women should be tested at least once during uh, pregnancy in the state of Florida. Um, they should be tested, uh, offered the test twice, once at the beginning of pregnancy and then again uh, in the third trimester. The CDC HIV testing algorithm was changed and released in 2014, and this does Im allow improved ability to diagnose acute HIV infection. It eliminates indeterminate Western blot results, which were uh, very difficult for many of us to deal with, and it allowed improved differentiation between HIV-1 and HIV-2, and it does have a very rapid test around. These are some references uh, for you to consider reviewing. 
uh, as you think about uh, improving or starting your routine uh, testing program at your own facility. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities, as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket-sized treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you're located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. 
To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.